Saddle. We're going to hit the ground running this morning. I uh, improvised a little bit this morning and decided I'm going to kind of veer a little bit away. Uh, I was actually going to read 2 Samuel 11 in its entirety this morning, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'll tell you why in just a minute. Instead, what I want to do is, is kind of highlight 2 Samuel chapter 11 for you. If you're not familiar with 2 Samuel chapter 11, I'd encourage you maybe to take a few minutes this afternoon and read it. It's uh, 27 verses, so it's not super long. Again, it's a narrative form, so it's like reading a story. Uh, but just for the sake of time, because there are some other passages this morning uh, that I did want to read. Um, so I'm just going to highlight 2 Samuel chapter 11. And maybe you're familiar with the historical account of David and his sin with Bathsheba. And if you didn't know it, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 is where you find that. And so I want to highlight some things for you uh, from 2 Samuel chapter 11. So in the opening verses of it, they tell us that when the kings went out to battle, David was in his house. And a, a series of events proceed to take place in David's house. He's up on the rooftop. He sees a beautiful woman bathing. This was the custom. The, the, the bathing areas would be on top of these flat houses out in sunlight. And when David sees this woman, he, he, he views her as beautiful, so he inquires of her. His men say, oh, that's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And he says, bring her to me. And um, so long story short, they bring Bathsheba to him. Uh, David lays with her. She becomes pregnant with child. And when she sends to David to tell him that she's pregnant with child, David panics. What am I going to do? Because the commander of my army, he's not the highest ranking, but he's right up there, Uriah the Hittite. He's out to battle, and he's going to come home and find out that his wife is pregnant. So he sends for Uriah, and Uriah comes home from the battlefield, and David spent some time, some time, spends some time with Uriah and encourages him to go home to his house, of course, seeking that Uriah would lay with his wife, and everybody would believe that the baby was Uriah. But well, Uriah doesn't do that. He's a noble man. He actually sleeps on the doorstep of King David's uh, castle, mansion, house, whatever you want to call it. And when David finds him there, he says, well, how can I go sleep in my bed when my men are out the battle? So the next night, David tries a different tactic. David, uh, he gets him intoxicated. He gets him drunk, trying to force him to go back to his house and lay with his wife. Only when David awakes in the morning, he finds Uriah sleeping with the men of David's home, David's house. Like, they're, they're sleeping in the same area. They're not sleeping together. They're sleeping in the same area. So once again, David's plan has foiled. So he comes up with another plan. He sends Uriah back to the battle. And with Uriah, he sends a note to give to Joab, the commander of the army. And he seals it with his signet, so we know that Uriah doesn't know what it says, because when he reaches King Joab, he breaks the signet, he opens it and reads. And here's what he told him, the commander of his army. I want you to put Uriah the Hittite at the front of the battle, where the fighting is the most fierce. And when, and when it reaches its pinnacle, Joab, I want you to pull your army back. Obvious reason for this is so that Uriah would die. And so everything unfolds from the time Uriah leaves David's company and goes to the battlefield, just as David plans that it would. Joab sends a messenger back to David to update him the status of the battle. Chief among the things that this individual who's been chosen by Joab to communicate to David is that Uriah the Hittite, among others, has died. So David is seemingly off the hook. He finds out that Uriah has died, so he once again sends for Bathsheba. They bring her, and he takes Bathsheba to be one of his wives. In verse 27 of 2 Samuel 11, the very end of the verse, we read this. But the thing that David had done was pleased to him. So what had David done? Well, David had neglected his responsibilities. As the king, he should have been at war with his men, not sitting at home on his couch. He should have been with his men. He advocated his responsibilities. He commits adultery with Bathsheba. He's dishonest with Uriah about why Uriah has been called from the battlefield. And when I say dishonest, he doesn't tell him why. He withholds it from him. The text doesn't say any specifics. 
it leads us to believe that he just didn't tell him, tell him why he had called him home. Not only that, but then when David sends Uriah back to the battlefield to ultimately be killed, he literally writes the letter and gives it to Uriah and says, go and give this to Joab. So now he has sent this man's death sentence by this man's own hand. And ultimately, David is responsible for the death and murder of Uriah. Twelve months goes by between 2 Samuel 11 and 7. At the end of 2 Samuel 11, we read the words, and the thing that David did displeased the Lord. In the first verse, I'm going to read actually 15 verses of 2 Samuel 12. So you can follow along. If you're there, you can look at it, or you can just listen. <clears throat> verse 1 of 2 Samuel 12, and the Lord sent Nathan to David came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man, <clears throat> excuse me, the rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and he grew it up with him and with his children, and he used it to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to visit him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Verse 7, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of Ephraim. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of his son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away all your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly sworn the Lord, the child who is born to you shall not die. And Nathan went to his house. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to him. And he did not sin. Again, the events of 2 Samuel 12 are approximately 12 months after events of chapter 11. And chapter 12 of 2 Samuel is the place where David is brought face to face with his sin. God sends the prophet Nathan to go to David and he speaks to him, we might call it a, in, in a parable, and he tells him a story about a rich man and a poor man, and David's furious. He's indignant that this rich man would take from the poor man to feed his own lust. And Nathan looks him in the face and says, David, that man is you. In the speaking of one sentence, David is brought face to face with the reality of his sin against Uriah the Hittite, against Bathsheba, as we'll see in a few moments, ultimately against the sovereign God of the universe. And when David was confronted with his sin, much like if hopefully there's people in our lives who will speak into our lives when necessary, when David's confronted with the sin, he could have responded in a, in a myriad of ways. But he responded as being confessed, acknowledging his sin, recognizing the offense that he had committed against, first and foremost, a holy God. 
scripture tells us he repented of his sin, and then in his repentance, he sought the forgiveness of God. And we find this evidence for us, as you see on the screen tonight, in Psalm 51. So if you've not turned to Psalm 51, I would invite you to do so. I don't want to make a few observations. We are going to read Psalm 51. I know that I just read 2 Samuel chapter 11, but I want to read Psalm 51 because this is David's response. When David is confronted with his sin, he recognizes the seriousness of sin. And let me say that as we begin. He doesn't recognize the seriousness of the sin of murder. He doesn't recognize the seriousness of the sin of adultery. He doesn't recognize the seriousness of the sin of lying. He recognizes the seriousness of sin, period. And we read these words in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. Sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Have your face from my sins, and blot out of all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with the work of your hands. And I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from my blood guiltness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Be good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in light sacrifices and burnt offerings and full burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I'm thankful for the truth that it is. I'm thankful, God, for examples of repentance, for examples of acknowledging sin, God, for example, people who took the sin in their sin. So I pray this morning as we begin, God, as we turn our attention to Psalm 51 and we make four observations, we would recognize four truths from Psalm 51, God, I pray that you would help us to see today, God, that you are the giver of forgiveness. Sins that we've committed ultimately are, are, are against you, first and foremost. Before we ever sin against anybody else, God, our, our sins are an affront to you and you for your purposes. Help us today, God, to see the person and the work of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of Christ. No matter how great the sin, no matter how great the sin, no matter how prolonged the sin has been, God, at the cross of Jesus Christ, we find forgiveness. Work in our hearts this morning as we seek your help in Jesus' name. Amen. As we know that David's sin was great. And when David became aware of his sin, he sought forgiveness for his sin. And so I want us, as we noted, to, to make note of four truths as found in Psalm 51. And the first truth is we must recognize where forgiveness is found. Is there enough paper on the back of the bulletin? It says when, not where, that's a typo. We must recognize where forgiveness is found. Ultimately, forgiveness is found in God. It comes from God. And David appeals to the source of forgiveness in his pursuit of forgiveness. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is actually how Psalm 51 opens up and begins. 
with David's request for forgiveness. He says in verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. The request for forgiveness, however, is not unique, right? All people of all time have recognized the reality of forgiveness. But there is a unique nature to the forgiveness that David desires. David's request, request for forgiveness is built upon the character of God. You see, I mean, we, we talked a couple weeks back about David's contemporaries in Mesopotamia, in this area that we might call the, the Middle East. Um, in the same way that we referenced them a couple weeks back, we'll reference them again this morning and say that the people that David lived among that worshipped the, the false gods, the, the pagan people of David's day, um, <clears throat> they believed, they understood that they had offended the gods. <clears throat> Excuse me. But unlike the God of Scripture, you never really knew why you offended the God. You never really knew if you had completely appeased the God. And therefore, you lived your entire life in this teeter totter, if you will, of am I forgiven? Am I not forgiven? I will throw out there that that sounds a lot like a works based salvation today. But David doesn't appeal to the character of these ever wavering, ever changing gods. In David's pursuit of forgiveness, he appeals to the sovereign God of the universe who has demonstrated his faithfulness and his character to the nation of Israel since its inception. It's important, I would submit, that we take note. David did not deserve to be forgiven by God. I mean, is there anything more vile and disgusting than what David did. I think today we'd probably say crimes committed against children. But after that, I mean, he pretty much covered the full game. And he didn't deserve to be forgiven by God. He had no claim to receive or to be the benefactor of God's generosity. And yet the character of God allows sinful mankind to seek forgiveness from the God of the universe. Because forgiveness is according to the grace of God. Not a claim to forgiveness, not a right to forgiveness. I understand that we live in a world now that is entitled and everything is, is owed to us and we deserve everything and we can have whatever we want when we want it. I want you to understand something. God's grace does not work that way. You have no claim to it whatsoever. You do not deserve God's grace. You do not deserve God's mercy. But somehow in his grace and in his mercy, he says, I will freely give it to you if you ask for it. If you genuinely desire my grace and my mercy, I will give it to you. Have you ever thought about this? God's forgiveness According to his grace, is a gift. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. There's nothing that entitles you to it. It's merely a reality that God says, I will extend forgiveness on the basis of my grace and my mercy. And David knew this. Because as much as he asks for forgiveness in verse 2, he bases this request upon verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. What a request. We don't talk about the things David has been through, the sins that David has committed. And in the face of those sins, when confronted with them from the family of the prophet, his request for God is, I'm the basis of a forgiveness. don't deserve your forgiveness, but yet God, you give it. And I would submit to you this morning, and I, I pray that you know and you understand this morning that it is a great and wonderful and magnificent thing that forgiveness from God is based upon his character. Not mine. Because if God's forgiveness for us was based upon our merit of it, we would never receive it. We must 
recognize where forgiveness is found. And in recognizing where forgiveness is found, we must understand, I would submit, I would say it this way, we must understand why we need this forgiveness. We need this forgiveness, and we need it from God, because ultimately, as we've touched on, God is the one who is offended by our sin. So we must not only recognize where forgiveness is found, but we must realize that we have sinned against God. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your sight. You know what he says? He says, I get, I deserve whatever you do to me, God. That's what David said. When he acknowledged his sin before God in verse 3, in verse 4, then he says, against you only have I sinned, I've done evil. He says, God, you would be justified to judge me. That's what David says in his heartfelt prayer to God. And he touches on the reality. You see, in verse 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and inward being, and you teach me wisdom. In the secret heart, David says, look, God, I recognize in a general sense I was brought forth in sin. Sin is the pervasive nature in this world, and I was born into sin just like everyone else is born into sin from my mother's womb forth. But in this instance, God, it's not just the general reality of my sinful nature. It's the fact that I have outwardly, willingly, painstakingly, God, I have sinned against you. And the interesting thing that I, I found myself thought, thinking about quite a bit this week was verse 3, he says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Now we know Psalm 51 is a product of Nathan the prophet going to David and confronting him with his sin. What we don't know is what God was doing in David's heart in those 12 or so months between when he conceived and had the right of the type bill and when he was confronted by Nathan the prophet. And he acknowledges this reality that my sin is before me. So whether for some period of these 12 months, whether it's from just now when Nathan came to me, I'm presented with the reality of my sin. And he says, first and foremost, it's an affront. And I keep saying this. I'm not being redundant. I, I'm not losing my place and my notes. I'm repeating over and over and over the reality that our sin, first and foremost, is an affront to the holy God of the universe. Here's why that. David is confronted with his sin. He's confronted by Nathan. He acknowledges his sin initially right there before Nathan. Nathan says, you're not going to die. That's not going to strike you dead for this sin. That's what we see initially. But then in Psalm 51, we see a, a more full-fledged response to his sin. And what we understand from his initial response to Nathan and from what we read in Psalm 51 is that David owned his sin. He didn't diminish it. Ah, it isn't that big of a deal. He didn't excuse it. Oh, it's not, God's not really offended. I mean, yeah, I guess it's unfortunate that Uriah is dead, but it's really not that big of a deal. David owned it. He owned it. I would submit to you this morning that one of the biggest issues in the church today, especially in the United States of America, is that professing followers of Christ are not eager to deal with sin. It's okay. We tolerate it. We dismiss it. We excuse it. My kids may be mad, so I respond in this way. If my wife would keep the house picked up and the laundry done, I would treat her with the gentleness that the Bible calls me to. If my husband would keep the yard mowed and he would be more involved with the children, I'd be more willing to engage in physical intimacy with him. 
I respect my parents if they let me do the things that I want to do or they give me the things that I want to do. This bit of gossip that I receive, it's just too juicy to keep to myself. The list goes on and on and on. But you know what these are? These are sin. These are sinful patterns. These are sinful habits and thoughts. And the church must stop defending them. Number one, other people in no capacity or instance is an excuse to engage in sinful actions. When Nathan went to David and said, Nathan, that man is you, he didn't say, but Nathan, you don't understand, man. Bathsheba, she was looking so good on that roof, I just had to have her. God understands. It's okay. I had to have Bathsheba. He's cool with it. No, what we read is that David, when he was confronted with his sin, sin he understood that in a moment's moment, moment, God was striking him dead for his sin. He said, I have sinned. Other people are never an excuse or a reason for us to engage in sinful actions. You and I, each of us, individually are responsible for our sin before God. No one else. So we must not seek to excuse sin, but we must deal with our sin. I want you to understand something. David touches there being brought forth in iniquity is the reality of the sin nature that we have. You may not know it this morning, but I'm getting ready to tell you your natural bent is for the sin. In and of yourself, your desire is for sinful things. And because we're bent towards sin, we have an overarching sin issue that must be addressed long before we can deal with specific sin in our lives. And that ultimately is the reality that that overarching sinful issue is that we're separated from God on the basis of the fact that we're sinners. So before you can ever deal with the individual sin in your life, whatever it may be, you have to deal with the reality that you're separated from God because sin is an offense to the holy God of the universe. And it's so serious it's so serious that Isaiah the prophet says it was the will of the Father to crush his son so that you could be forgiven of your sin. That's how serious sin is. It was the will of the Father to crush his son so that man could have forgiveness. Scripture is very clear. Sin is a serious issue. Should never seem to diminish the sin in our lives. We must be quick to deal with that. Dealing with sin, though, because we're naturally sinners, dealing with sin is not naturally what we want to do. You know, a lot, a lot of people have a lot of ideas about how church works, right? Like you go to church on Sunday morning and we're a part of the service. Uh, you know, we might help greet, we might help uh, pick up the offering, we, we might even give to the offering. We've got all these ideas about how church works, and, and most of our ideas about how church works stop at about 10 a.m. when we leave church. But one of the things that we see in this sinful pattern that David began to establish in his life is the importance of the people of the church in our lives. We need people, right? Because, listen, I'm going to tell you something. Left to myself, because even though I'm a believer, left to myself, I'm still naturally sinful. And so when it comes to my sin, I got things on, right? You got to throw things on with the blinders, right? I don't see my sin most of the time. But by God's grace, he puts people into my life that are willing to speak truth when I need to hear it. See, that's what Nathan did here for David. And when our, when our concept of church is we meet in a building for an hour and 15 minutes on a Sunday, you totally miss the point. The reality of church is it's the body of Jesus Christ, and they fellowship together, and they grow together, and they serve one another, and they serve the body as a whole. And part of that is being willing to say hard things. Sometimes it's a big deal, sometimes it's not. We went to Holiday World last week. And there was a 
uh, a family from the church that they went with us. And these were the missionaries that went with us that were here. And of course, we all kind of we all drove separate or whatever. Well, I went to Poland in part, and you guys know that Sharon and I have shared before that uh, one of the things that we love most in the world is the fact that people can't drive. And um, so I went to try to pull in a park, and these people were all caddy walking, and I couldn't get in, and I back up, pulling that, pulling that, and I'm just backing in, and I got out of the truck. I looked at Roger, and I said, he was one of them who was there, and I said, man, people can't drive. And, uh, you know, that was kind of it. You know, I was like, ah, frustrated people. Well, we get into the park, and we walk back to the water park, and the kids go out there and start playing in the water. And Roger comes up to me and just says, hey, I just wanted you to know that you know, when you pulled in the park and got out, you flustered and, oh, man, people can't drive. There was some lady just, like, standing there watching you. And, uh, so, dang. Because the reality is, I had a shirt on that Roger thought was representative of the park and was flying. But that's not the point. Even if my church wouldn't, or my shirt wouldn't have said anything about church, <clears throat> What if that lady would have showed up for church this morning? It's like, oh, that's the guy that was mad in the parking lot. And again, I wasn't that mad, but that was the beauty of somebody who's willing to come alongside and say, hey, you want to be aware of this? Because, you know, maybe next time you're really frustrated and then you're slamming the door or, you know, whatever. Right? Like, we need people in our lives. Like, who, who in your life can speak hard truth to you and you're willing to receive it? Do you have that person? Because if you don't have that person, you're in a dangerous place. You're blind to the reality of sin. You need somebody to speak hard truths into your lives. And when hard truths are spoken into our lives, and when we're made aware of a sinful uh, pattern or habit or choices or decisions, and again, I'm not saying, I don't know, maybe I'd have to ask Roger, I don't think he came to me saying that I was in sin last week, but just, hey, about, you know, just kind of be aware. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't like I got on the truck screaming, swearing, or anything like that. Just a little flustered with people, but it still said something. And he loves me enough to say, "Hey, be mindful of this." But here's the reality: when there is somebody who loves you enough to say, "You want to be mindful of this," or you need to deal with this sin, if there's somebody in your life that loves you enough to do that, the next thing I want you to understand, the next truth is that you have to desire it. If you don't desire to be forgiven, you won't be forgiven. A.W. Pink once said this, It's not the absence of sin, but the grieving over it which distinguishes the child of God from empty professors. Let me read this again. It's not the absence of sin, but the grieving over it which distinguishes the child of God by empty professors, Pink was in his primary years. It's the grieving of sin that separates the saved from the unsaved. The grieving of sin in our lives. And here's the reality. When we grieve our sin, you know what the natural response to grieving our sin is? We want to be forgiven. When we grieve our sin, understanding that it is an affront to the God of the universe, Desires to be forgiven. Verse 10 in this section is typically the, the verse that gets all the attention, and rightfully so. Because in verse 10, David, he, he makes his desires clear. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David's desire is that his heart would be clean and that it would be pure before God and that his spirit would be right. <clears throat> David desires to be forgiven and cleansed from his sin, to be restored into that right relationship with God. He literally asked God to do that in verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. It's important we don't miss what David is saying here. Sin in our lives robs us of the joy that the gospel promises. When we tolerate sin in our lives, and again, 
I mean, I should, should probably should have said this earlier. Scripture is not calling for perfection. Right? Consider the, the quote that we just referenced. The beat. It's not the absence of sin. It's the grieving of sin. And so, Scripture is not saying you ought to be perfect. You ought to be sinless. Say what Scripture says is you ought to be grieved by your sin. And one of the, the byproducts of sin in our lives when we're okay with it, when we tolerate it, is that it robs us of our joy. The presence of sin in the life of a person who is indwelt with the Holy Spirit is not okay. And it shouldn't be okay in your life. If you have the Holy Spirit of God and it convicts you of sin, you have a choice to make. You can quench the Spirit, as Paul says not to do. Do not quench the Spirit. Or you can, and quenching that is, is excusing it, writing it up is not that big of a deal, blaming it on someone else, or when the Holy Spirit, if you're a believer and you're involved with the Holy Spirit, but it brings the conviction of sin into your life. James is clear here, understanding the effects of sin on his life. Communicates that he desires not his sin, but more than his sin, he desires the presence of God. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. You see, in the Old Testament, God would send his spirit for given purposes, for given times. It wasn't the same as in, in, in the New Covenant. We understand that Christ has died, and, and that in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, when the person places their faith and trust in Christ, they're indwelt permanently with the Holy Spirit of God. But in the Old Testament, God would send His Spirit, He would take it away. And David understood this, and he, look, he says, Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Because more than David sinned, David wanted, desired, and longed for the presence of God in his life. So ultimately, when we recognize, David recognizes his needs, and he needs spiritual renewal. He needs inner spiritual renewal. He needs God to work and do what only God can do. And I would submit to you this morning, unapologetically, unashamedly, that our church is not full of people who need spiritual renewal. I'm convinced. Do we sinfully reduce the cross of Christ to nothing more than a license to sin and to excuse sin instead of rightly seeing the cross as the means of freedom from sin? The cross isn't about doing whatever you want and sinning against the God of the universe. The cross is what says you can have freedom from sin. The indwelt believer, the, the individual who has the Holy Spirit of God, can never look at the cross and say, this means that I can sin and God's forgiveness will abide. No, you look at the cross and you say, God's forgiveness has already abound, and in willful submission, I recognize the affront that sin is to God. So much so that he gave the cross so that I could be free from sin, not be in bondage to it. Now, David didn't see his sin in light of the cross. Obviously, David lived a couple thousand years before the cross. He did see his life God's in light of God's holiness. He did see his sin in light of God's perfection. And you and I, we see God's holiness and God's perfection. At least we ought to when we look at the cross. And I would submit to you this morning that much like David did, when we look at the cross and we consider the reality of it and we consider sin, our conclusion ought to be the same as David's. We need inner spiritual renewal. Everybody wants revival in our country. Everybody wants God to work miraculously. Listen, could he? Yes. Do I think he will work in spite of sinful people who have no time for God? No, I don't think he's going to. And if he does, it's probably going to be in his judgment. You really want revival? Then live your life for the glory of Jesus. David's eyes, and it needs to be in our eyes, it's time to quit playing the 
David viewed this forgiveness, this grace and this mercy, this blotting out of his transgressions, this cleansing, this renewed heart, and he he viewed these things as necessary. And we know this is true because of the way he started this section in verse 7. Purge me with this up, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than the snow. See, in the Old Testament, the high priest would go into the temple once a year, and he would make a covenant with his own people. And he would do this by taking a branch and dipping it in the blood of the sacrificed heifer, and he would scatter on the altar. You know what kind of branch he used to do that? This David is David is recognizing very clearly, very openly, that this sprinkling of blood on the altar that was representative of the sin being atoned for, he, that's what he's saying. My sin has been atoned for. And now his quest or his request of God is that God would purge him in the same way that God would clean him. That God would make a new heart in him. That he would renew it is the word that he uses. But you see, today we don't need a high priest to go in once a year on the Day of Atonement and take a hyssop branch and spread blood all over the altar to atone for our sin. Why? Because it was atoned for at the cross. And someone asked, are you in need of inner spiritual renewal? Don't make it seem like a fancy thing. Don't make it seem like some super spiritual, although it absolutely is an act of divine goodness. And don't overthink it. Just receive the question for what is intended to be. Is sin present in your life? Are you willfully tolerating and excusing and living, reveling in things that Scripture has clearly defined as sin? And are you doing so as though it's okay? Do you recognize if you've trusted Christ and that's how you're living that you have forfeited the joy of your salvation? It's amazing to me how often people who identify with the church willfully live in sin and can't figure out why their lives are a mess. Now, God's not a genie. That's not my point. We don't rub a lamp and make some wishes. But if we live completely, openly, contradictory to what he says in his word, why do we expect his blessings? Deal with sin today. Be restored into a right relationship with God. Be forgiven and cleansed of all of us. The last thing I want to see this morning is this purpose of forgiveness. Is that we must respond rightly to the forgiveness that we receive. This has been our desire to be forgiven, and we've been forgiven. We see here, David, in writing Psalm 51, there's a response to the forgiveness that he has. David says, The cup of grace is delivered to my soul. I will recognize God that there's no other reason than the fact that you are good. He says, I will speak of your ways and I will teach those who need to hear. And who are those who need to hear? Sinners. And David says, and when they hear God, they'll return to you. When they hear of their sin and they accept it for what it is and they repent God like me, they will return to you. And then may they go and praise you. May they go and tell others. May we see more sinners return to you. This is what I just described, right? What I just talked about. Everybody wants to move, but nobody wants to live for Christ. David says, I will sing and I will tell God, I will tell of your righteousness. I want you to notice verses 16 and 17. David's going to respond to this forgiveness that he has from God. And he's going to tell of the goodness of God. And he says, for you will not delight in sacrifice, God. If you would delight, I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. You've got to understand that this was how the people were made right with God in the Old Testament sacrificial system. They offered sacrifices. And, and what David says here, do not miss. 
God, if you wanted me to burn a heifer, I would do it. But God, your greatest desire isn't that I would burn a heifer on the altar. He says in verse 17, the sacrifices of God. That means the sacrifices that God receives and are pleasing to him are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not be Out of the Bible, so majestic, powerful, Overwhelming, all consuming, flat on that side. And at the exact same time, personal, gracious, and passionate. His desire is not for people to sacrifice to him in meaningless ways, just going through the motions and, and, and doing church or being a Christian. God's desire is for his people to walk humbly with him. To live their lives knowing and understanding that his desire is to have your heart. And that the desire to have your heart far outweighs his desire to have your wallet. Or anything else. And we understand magnitude, cost, to be able to be forgiven by God. A God of forgiveness and ability to us. Not our belief us. We understand, when we begin to understand, the writer of Proverbs 1 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So when you begin in the smallest of ways to understand who God is and understand what God has done, then you will become wise. And part of that becoming wise is, is this reality of when you start to weigh just how magnificent God is just how holy God is and just how sinful we are and then to reconcile that reality he gave his perfect, spotless, holy son. When you begin to recognize this, the only response is humility and a desire to walk with God for no other reason than because he's been gracious. I asked you earlier if it was sin in your life and you were excused and Let me ask you the question another way. Does the awesome, all powerful, all gracious, all holy, all knowing, all majestic, all forgiving God of the universe have your heart? Forget about the rest. Forget about all the noise. Does your heart belong to Christ Jesus? I want you to understand that this is the essence of forgiveness. That you belong to God and that God belongs to you. And you may be here this morning. Maybe you're a professing believer in Christ and you're, you're sitting here thinking, man, I, I, there's some, some things in my life I really got to do, but I, I, you know, I, there's sin and I've I put it off for too long and I need to deal with it. Maybe somebody here this morning can be thinking, God can never forgive you. You think I've done too much. I've gone too far. I've been too harsh. Whatever it is that, that, that we would define, or whatever the scripture would define as sin, we say this is too much, or this is too big for God to forgive. I want to point your attention back to where we were. And encourage you to remember that God is the way of forgiveness. is God. The truth is, forgiveness is hard sometimes. And just because God forgives, in the case of David, just because God forgave David didn't mean that there were not consequences for his sin. And there very well may be consequences for our sin. It doesn't mean that God doesn't forgive us. If you go home and you read 2 Samuel 11 and 12, and then you read on to 12 and find that this was made to told David, his son will become saved and his baby died. And not only did his baby die, but we see is um, David told him that God said the sword will never leave your family. You know how many of the Psalms, I don't really answer this question, there's a number of them. You know how many of the Psalms are written while David's running from his only son who's trying to kill him? He wants his throne. He's trying to kill David. 
is just one example of the, the strife and the difficulty that exists in the way of God as a result of this. But it doesn't mean that David wasn't forgiven. He was. And he was spared it from the consequences of his sin. But I want you to know this morning as we finish, God is gracious, He's merciful. David healed of that race and that was the any person who's willing to surrender their heart and trust Christ will receive forgiveness of their sins. I would be the words that it said in Psalm 51, verse 7. A broken heart.